Hello, everybody, and welcome to another session of the Right Circle, an initiative of Prabha Khaitan Foundation. Today's session is in association with Indian Norwegian community. Established by Dr. Prabha Khaitan, Prabha Khaitan Foundation provides platform to caregivers, committed individuals, and like-minded institutions to implement cultural, educational, literary, and social welfare projects in India. The pandemic has not been able to detail the foundation's noble cause. Prabha Khaitan Foundation has shifted gears using the virtual world to continue with the various sessions to keep up the spirits of its patrons. The Right Circus strives to bring together authors and their readers in an informal and engaging setting. The session just the sessions are structured around the life and works of the author, followed by an interaction with the audience. The Right Circus started its journey from Jaipur and now has sessions across India and, in, and even overseas in Oxford, Birmingham, New York, and Oslo. Today we have with us Ms. Kavita Kane. Kavita is the best-selling author of six novels and today she is considered, considered a revolutionary force in Indian writing mainly because she has brought in feminism in where it is most needed, mythology. All her six novels are based on lesser known women in Indian mythology. Kannan's Wife, 2013, Sita, Sita's sister 2014 on Ramayana's most ne neglected character Urmila. Menka's choice 2015 on the Apsra Menka. Lanka's princess 2016 on Surpanakha, the female antagonist in the Ramayana. The Fisher Queen's dynasty on Satyavati. The Grand Matriarch in the Mahabharata and the latest one, Ahilya's Awakening on Ahilya who is ironically one of the most revered as well as the most doubted character in the Ramayana. In conversation with her is Miss Dipali Basin, a SAS woman of Delhi. Now would, rec uh, now would request the audience to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much, Arundhi, for that introduction. And um, good evening, um, Kavita Ji, how are you? Um, Kavita Ji has actually written seven books and her latest book is Saraswati's Gift. And we'll be focusing a lot on Saraswati's Gift today. Uh, so um, I'm gonna start with you with this question, Kavita Ji, that all your novels are based on lesser known women in Indian mythology, like Karna's wife, Uruvi, Sita's sister, Urmila, Ahilya, among others. Now, these are women who did not find proper space in the epics. What would have been the possible reasons to overlook such characters in ancient texts? And why did you choose to bring them to the forefront to make them visible and share their outlook when nobody questioned and missed this aspect earlier? I think there's a reason why they are uh, minor characters. Um, because the Rama and the protagonist is Draupadi and uh, uh, I mean it's Sita and in Mahabharata it's uh, Draupadi. So I think many times we sort of tend to overlook the other women in these uh, in the epics. So I think it was more by default than anything else. It started off with Karna's wife, who, by the way, Urvi is a fictitious character. Uh, she yeah. is not. But I think uh, uh, Urmila, like the second book, uh, Sita's sister, I mean, I was very keen on knowing about, personally, I was very keen. I think it started from my innate curiosity to know about what might have happened to her. In the many people don't even know that she was Sita's sister in the sense they were all, she, you know her as, I don't know whether they know her as uh, Lakshman's wife or so. this whole concept of sister turning to sisters-in-law. I think that itself, the relationship change, that was very intriguing. And I think I started off with that. So I think what I'm trying to say, whether the, uh, including the seven uh, protagonists of my seven books is that most of them are marginalized. Most of them are overlooked characters. The reason being that they are minor characters. They are not the heroines of the epic. So I think they are the different women populating the epic. So I was sort of but each one has a story to tell. Each one has a story we would find equally fascinating because I think they were remarkable women in their own right. And I think it's, I think we need to know their story. I think each of them is so different. None of them is like we can say, remind us of, oh, she sounds like that or she sounds, she is like that. No, each one of them, however small the character is, I think uh, each one of them is unique. Each one of them is strong. Each one of them is very complex. And most importantly, each of them is there because there is a reason for them to be there. They are involved in the progress of the plot in some way or the other. So I think that importance I really wanted to sort of highlight. And through that one single factor, I think I weave the story around and made a book out of it. 
uh, right. they, they are different stories and mahabharat especially is uh, it's literally a web of stories so i think i think i just wanted to show some just stories of different uh, uh, especially women characters whom we sort of get sidelined uh, the that uh, sometimes uh, we overlook them we know about them we are familiar about them but we just overlook them because of i think over familiarity also and we sort of it's sort of but we really don't example let's say surpana kaul even urmila or meenka we know we are very familiar with these names but we really don't know much about them besides the little episode which they are known for which sort of defines them so i think something more than that particular episode so i think it was i think it honestly started from my own career okay how exactly do you flesh out characters uh, there's barely any information available on them so is it based on your interpretation of their responses and behavior with respect to the main characters in the epic or say if you're talking about um, urmila you know so you're talking uh, do you do you, do you interpret her on the basis of how she would have reacted to lakshman or say uh, sita Yes, yes, completely. Because uh, whether it's Satyavati in uh, the Fisher Queen Dynasty or Ayilya or uh, Saras or uh, Sarathati is a major deity, but you know other six characters. I'm what I'm uh, my protagonist. I'm talking about. Yes, because I think there was not much information about them, and I had to depend largely on uh, the bigger characters, the major characters involved in her life, and uh, also the major events. You know, so it's like the characters and the events. uh they became she was there was a skeletal, skeletal story and i sort of used the events and the other characters to sort of flesh out the entire uh, narrative as such because uh, her story because uh, as i said they are minor characters there is nothing much about them so i had to rely completely on uh, as you said urmila is largely based as sita sister she is lakshman's wife she is even uh, janak's daughter i mean that was a very important aspect of her personality so i think how these characters satyavati satyavati i think the major character was bishma through bishma what i could sort of glean because not only there's less information about them they are they might be like for example satyavati is there for a very long time in the epic but she is sort of in the background so the the story which are then where she is in the forefront is a very small episode so linking this small episode with the other uh, events and episodes uh, and the characters and i think through that i sort of build up the character and of course there is my more than my interpretation i think i sort of dramatize what might have been so i think it's uh, let's say 80% uh, fact and 20% fiction so i think i think i sort of but yeah the dramatization is a certain creative license which i think which every author do does take absolutely So now I'm going to be talking about. I, I just thought I'll start off with your latest book, uh, Saraswati's Gift, and then you know go uh, to other books after this. So we all know Saraswati as the goddess of knowledge, art, and music. Perhaps even as a lost river, or as one who, despite being married to Brahma, is seen and worshipped as a singular goddess. Mm-hmm. Who sets Saraswati apart from other goddesses, and why was she your first choice when you decided to write this book? i think the very fact that i think i personally believe that she is one of the most marginalized goddesses we we know so much about parvati we know about lakshmi but i think saraswati besides the time we sort of remember her during a exam time or when we do the puja otherwise i think because she is more than a goddess she is an abstract thought she is a she should be a way of living where she is a constant teacher so where i have not sort of limited her to being a goddess i have tried to humanize her and more than that more than that i think i've tried to humanize an abstract thought where educate the important of education the important of intellect the important of information and how all these are weapons for humanity and man and how he has used it for his purpose so saraswati here becomes more than just a goddess she becomes the very personification of education and information and knowledge and wisdom which she is supposed to have gifted to us so are we really is man does he deserve that gift does man uh, use has he used that gift uh, productively and i think there are other alert questions but i heard the whole thing was saraswati i think it essentially came because i think i saw saraswati moth and i think it happens to all the goddesses they are more than the deities uh, we sort of we have sort of deified them in the sense when you say she is a she is a goddess of music and art how did she get music 
what does she mean? What do you mean that she is the goddess of music? What does it mean when she's a goddess of art? What does it mean to be a goddess of knowledge? What is knowledge according to her, which she is going to give us, which she is going to impart to us? So I think it was more about a very, uh, I wouldn't say spiritual, but definitely an abstract thought where uh, we need to understand the fundamentals of getting information and getting knowledge and education. What does education for me? Till you use education for a proper use, it is not a good education. So I think the whole argument is always, I mean, between the husband and wife, between Brahma and Saraswati, I think that is the argument that the entire definition of knowledge. So I think I was trying to answer those questions for herself and I think I put it out in the open. Right. So now we're talking about Brahma and Saraswati. So when we talk of Brahma and Saraswati, one thinks of a creator and a creation mm -hmm. of Brahma as the mind and uh, Saraswati as wisdom. The, so the imagery is one of a symbiotic relationship between the two of them where one cannot do without the other. Yet, when it comes to love, the mm -hmm. definition is completely different. Brahma becomes a victim of the emotion he has created. That's love. And he's hopelessly in love and, and, love, and he gives it all. What is the meaning of love for Saraswati? I think for her, she, uh, I think she's a person who's ruled by the mind, not by the heart at all. So eventually, even if she does fall in love, it's always going to be the mind which is going to rule her, not never the heart. So I think later on as the relationship prog progresses, I think that is exactly it. So I think it happens even to, uh, in our, to us in our daily life. Right? A person who is more, that's the person who you say is cold or unfeeling. It's not that. There are some people who are, who believe reasoning is the core foundation of the entire survival. So I think Saraswati was exactly that. For her emotions, she, of course, she, of course she, she didn't deny the emotions. She knew they were there, but how important are they for her? For her, the mind, the priority of the mind, uh, the entire purpose and uh, goal of the mind is more important than the heart. So I think it was more a clash between, definitely a clash between uh, emotion and reasoning. So it's completely Emotion hard. is a way that uh, she's, a, she's being created by Brahma, so she, should, she was there for a purpose. And that's the reason why she kept love at the background. Yes, because I think she, she realized after a point of time, because I think which uh, Brahma doesn't realize, he has created her out of a certain a certain admiration, personal admiration. She is his muse, she is his inspiration, she is his vision. So for him, she is the perfect woman. But for her, he is not the perfect person in the first place. So she is a very rational, fair, sort of a, a very practical woman who sees it doesn't come to her. It does, everything doesn't boil down to her after a point of time. She sees the entire situation in the big picture and she realizes that she's just a small part of it. That is what her reasoning tells her. So even if it's a romance between her and Brahma, she realizes it's more. She realizes that the feelings are more from his side than it's from her side. And how fair is it in a relationship when it is such an unequal relationship, when one is giving more and the uh, other person is taking uh, more, you know, that sort of thing. So, and then, of course, gradually she learned. It's also a learning process for her. But uh, I think it was the, this whole thing about Brahman Saraswati is actually the core of any human relationship, whether it's husband, wife, whether it's any sibling, whether it's colleague, whether it's mother, daughter, child. Uh, the clash between uh, emotions, which Saraswati believes that actually dulls your reasoning power and the might of reasoning, you know, where you sort of think out, be sensible about love, you know, so the whole, uh, so she believes more in love than romance. So it is, uh, I think it's a very practical way of yes. the way she approaches uh, uh, not only her relationship with uh, Brahma, but generally, I think she is a person who is uh, cautious, who sort of, sort of weighs things before, uh, because that her, her, her uh, I think the Brahma by creating calm, you know, this whole thing of, I think that that is a factor which I've also included where Brahma himself becomes the victim of calm. So if Brahma can become the victim of calm, so that means she doesn't want to be. So she challenges, you know, the whole concept of can you make it? Can you make, can you sort of sub subjugate mind to love? You know, that is a question. So I think it's always an eternal, this, this is an eternal question, which is better, or which is more powerful or which is what you what which is more favored the mind or the heart so i think for her the mind wins for him the heart wins yes uh, so in the book there is also a very interesting conversation 
about uh, between Parvati and Saraswati, where mm-hmm. one talks about the true joy of motherhood and mm-hmm. how unusual it is to want babies, mm-hmm. while the other talks about choosing to be child-free as a conscious decision. Now, this mm-hmm. is a, a paradox that many young women face even today. So could you throw light on the message that you wanted to convey through this conversation in the book? Uh, the message is exactly that. I think it's if Parvati is the epitome of motherhood and uh, Saravati discounts marriage and motherhood, it shows two facets of a woman's choice. You know, they are if a woman wants, if a woman decides to have children, have to marry, to have children, that is her choice. A. If a woman wants, doesn't want to marry, she does, or she wants to marry and she doesn't want to have children, that is also a choice. So here it's a question of how different moods, how different emotions, how different choices define womanhood. I think it was not a message. It was, I was just trying to say that there are different types of women and you should respect their choices. So one should not be denigrated or sort of shamed because she has made a certain choice. That is her choice. That is her life. And she has decided to go ahead. So it, I think Saraswati is never, when she says that she doesn't believe in marriage and she doesn't believe in motherhood, doesn't mean that she is sort of laughing at other people who are doing that. So that the entire conversation between Parvati and Saraswati is exactly that. They are two spokespersons of two different thoughts of family life and each one is right in his own way so i think each one and i think at the end of it both of them there is a certain there is a definitely a huge mutual respect they have for each other but there's a, there's a mutual respect about each other's choices also you have to understand why the other person is there, instead of sort of just coming to a judgment and judging the other person so i think it was the message was a do not judge you know let if the, that is a choice a person has made she has made for a certain reason Try to understand the reason instead of judging. And is it also not a, a falling into the societal pressure, you know, like we have own definitions of a woman, of her being, you know, getting married or being a mother? Yes, because this whole, I think these are the two pillars of uh, societal expectation from a woman, that she has to be a mother and she has, she has to be a wife and she has to be a mother. This whole concept of nature, nurture, the whole her role as a, she is the when you say she's the heart of the family because she nurtures the family and which is something that definition is something which Saraswati sort of tries to keep away from because she said no I don't want to get involved in. and there are a lot of women who do that because that is exactly what the whole if there, there's one goddess if there's Lakshmi there's Parvati there is Saraswati if Lakshmi is power Lakshmi is fortune Saraswati is knowledge there are three factors there are three weapons of or there are three Literally, there are three factors for human progress. Without power, wealth, and knowledge, man is not going to progress. The thing is, knowledge, when you're talking about Saraswati and when her decisions which she had made in her life, she symbolizes certain things. She, uh, Parvati symbolizes she, she is the mother of Kartikya and Ganesh, and Lakshmi is there. So, there are three women, there are different forms of uh, women's decisions. Right. Women's role, it's not a women's role, it's a women's role which they have decided to play themselves. It is not what is expected of them. So this whole thing is that they are individual, but they are also symbiotic. And I think most importantly, it is their personal choice, it is their personal decision, who which they respect and they expect other people to respect. You know? So the whole thing is, there are different facets of women, and there are different facets of uh, a certain decision, the I think it, it could, uh, I'm not talking only about women here, I'm talking also about humanity as such. You know, we take, we have sort of <coughs> made people, characters, and people into stereotypes. I think that's very convenient for us to define things. It is exactly breaking the stereotype because our goddesses, who are, I personally believe, are feminist icons because. Uh, each one of them celebrates a certain virtue, a certain emotion, a certain quality. When I say virtue, I mean a quality. Uh, I'm not saying virtuous. So different <coughs> facets of a woman, and we have goddesses, whether it's Saraswati, Parvati, or Lakshmi, whether it's Rati, whether it's Ganga. <coughs> so all these goddesses, when we say they are goddesses, why have they, why have they become goddesses? We are sort of acknowledging, accepting that they are different types of women, their types of womanhood, their types of you know, women decision, their 
uh, roles in society as a in the societal person as a family person as an individual most importantly as an individual and each of them should be respected and celebrated the whole thing is not the most important part is being respected you know the or being true to oneself i guess also yes of course and the thing is because when you say maybe when you sort of sort of reduce them to stereotypes it they become very simple embodiments of something which is very convenient for you all you know convenient for you all in the sense for society so we do not want to see any goddess who say oh we can't even believe that there was a goddess who, who was who sort of discounted marriage in madhav you know that itself is a shock because we are so used to seeing this old <coughs> glorifying a woman as a mother and as a wife <coughs> that you can't imagine yes she can she can be equally important and it quickly see equally significant when she decides decides not to do or not to be the part of these two, take on these two roles so i think uh, so that the sort of embodies that factor so um whether it is uruvi urmila or, or or in this book like saraswati's gift in uh, saraswati in this book these are all very strong female protagonists to what extent have they been a reflection of your character oh uh i think you can include sapna calls on that so oh, yes <laughs> <laughs> so because she uh, she was actually the most uh, she was misunderstood right was that she was misunderstood also to yeah she was extent. misunderstood and that's again uh, she was uh, that uh, then again, i think it sort of continues the same argument which you have before because we tend to judge people very easily i think she became a uh, she became a victim of her own uh, uh image which she had sort of uh, we have sort of given to her anyway uh, besides that uh, you are talking about this character as a part of me uh, no i don't think so honestly because i think i try to put myself in the character you know i try to be as fair and just and believable and rational i can so whether it's the whether these character or even other characters in the book i try it whichever anyway they are saying any line or any situation i really literally i put myself in the shoe then sort of for, for me it's an enacting of that scene so no right. i don't think it is a part of me because i think then it would be i would too complicated it i don't think i'm a very complex person but anyway <laughs> but these are questions i think after a point uh, are you realize that it's not <clears throat> an author an author cannot be a solitary figure he when you when writing of course it's a solitary pro- profession but when he is writing is imbibed by the other thing that there are social issues there there there, there are different issues which are there are <clears throat> the problems and there are situations currently which are happening that can should be re- sort of reflected in the work so i think these characters are also have a very strong contemporary sensibility because they are a product of today also so in the sense that the very fact it's not a story of thousands of years ago it's a story which is very even very relevant today so i think <clears throat> imbibing me uh, imbibing them with all this uh, layering yeah. them i think so i think it's they have but their character is much bigger than me so i don't think <clears throat> the only part of me which is there is the thinking process nothing <clears throat> So talking about stories that are relevant even today so well, let's talk about ahalya's awakening which is oh, a yeah. it's a short episode of uh, hindu mythology you know that you put in the spotlight where ahalya is an enigma she's almost a silent woman known essentially for her seduction by indra mm-hmm. her curse by her husband rishi gautam for infidelity and her liberation from that curse by ram mm-hmm. now um is this the story Uh, about love and loyalty in a marriage or is there a bigger picture by the perspective that you want the reader to peep into you know something that is relevant even today in modern society that's caught in a similar tussle of adultery loyalty divorce and fact patriarchy yes because i think that's what i mean when you're talking about earlier yes, sorry i think i got the maximum <clears throat> response from readers that they could identify because it's also about disappointment in love and marriage you know this whole thing it's not about just loyalty and love in a marriage because uh, there are three men i mean let's talk about ahilya there are three men in her life in, in the story it's yes. her husband is gautam indra and eventually ram yeah. where yeah. Uh, you don't get to see her version of the story at all she's she, i think she's the most voiceless character and uh, her, her her this particular episode of ahilya is almost a precursor what's going to happen to sita so where i think here the societal <coughs> uh, role is very important you know because whatever punishment of your dear i think after a point is not about love and loyalty in marriage it's about the punishment to the woman 
which becomes the core factor <coughs> that is given by society most important it's more than gautam skulls <coughs> which is still happening today we sort of judge again as said we sort of judge a person we may come to our own conclusion and we sort of condemn her so right. from a devoted wife she moves she sort of moves completely and very fast very swiftly she moves into a promiscuous woman how and why i think that was what is the story of ahilya where she decides to she takes a certain decision and i think the strength of her character is that she is ready to suffer the consequences of the decision which i think all of us do but that does not mean that she regrets that decision so the whole thing is a woman's life it again this whole societal expectations you have from her right. which is again very hypocritical to the expectations you have from a man so i think uh, the, i try to uh, i try to take the original story of uh, valmiki with raman where <clears throat> because i think ahilya's uh, the definition of or the her character has completely changed over the century you know she sort of becomes a victim no she is not a victim she never was a victim she become she became a victim because of patriarchy in the later story in that particular original story it is her decision to go ahead with indra is not that i am endorsing or that story is endorsing infidelity here it is here actually questioning the role of the husband and the wife if right. the wife has done that the husband is equally to blame so in the original story gautam is also there to be blamed because there is a certain reason why she does that why did she go th- do that because there was a certain void in her marriage so all this i think is so beautiful that this story which has been told thousands of years ago and they had the wisdom to tell us <clears throat> the core yeah. of any relationship or marital relationship and then how it got reduced to a patriarchal statement that okay she becomes she is the promiscuous woman and then she becomes a victim where the story actually changes in where indra raped her no indra does not rape her he does of course he being he he uses subterfuge i'm not saying that but she recognizes him for what he is and she goes ahead but does that is her decision that recognize? is the origin yes of course that Because is the origin she doesn't so recognize him no no she definitely recognizes him and she goes ahead then the whole situation changes because the if she has not recognized then yes then she is the victim then you would definitely say she is the victim but she is not a victim and that is exactly the strength and the most significant aspect of ahilya so i think and that whole paradox about her a woman ahilya being a woman of no blemishes so and then she becomes we as a society river her you know it's like these become <clears throat> figures or become symbols of fidelity or infidelity and a devoted wife so the, all this is very ironical so i think if you see the core story the original story and the complexity is and what it is trying to say i think besides i it is also the story of gautam and indra most important because they are it's they are part of a triangle and of of all of them were responsible for the situation they were in. so i think so when we talk about gautam again gautam's course is sort of completely changed over the years no it's not she didn't get changed into a rock at all it was more a question of self actualization and self realization very so she turns where he said he, she moved in world so the whole thing is a discovery of herself so it's a journey where she realizes she had made this and then what so does she accept him or does she not accept him as a husband later also is a question so <clears throat> that i think that is the part where the fact fact and fiction came uh, role right. came about again but uh, i think earlier story that's why it's very applicable very relatable is because i think uh, we condemn we sort of pass judgment on women very easily even now and women as women are worse so okay. i think it's very it's very very so it's like where aile herself suffers her daughter you know everyone rejects her so how she becomes there she becomes a victim mm-hmm. there <clears throat> when instead of trying, no one is trying to really understand her situation and then she sort of cornered and she took her, you know that whole she becomes a victim of a societal uh, callousness i should say where after a point they are not part of the entire or seen at all it's 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 it's, it's, it's more about a husband wife relationship so so i think it happens again as you said it's divorce and when we're talking about love marriage separation divorce i think all this i mean see how many times the other factors are 
responsible for the right. relationship to break. It's not just your, it's just between a husband and a wife. Absolutely. So, you know, when you talk about, and I'm talking about a Supranaka, you mm-hmm. call her the Lanka's princess. Was she really a Lanka's princess? She was, a, she was born as a disappointment to Kalkesi. Then, you know, even her mother, her mother, you know, when she was born as Minakshi, and mm-hmm. um, later on, her husband gets, uh, Vidyu Jeeva gets uh, killed by Ravan. So was she really a misunderstood princess? And did she really, um, the fact that uh, she tried to use Ram, and not many people know this, that, you know, did she try to use Ram and Lakshman to actually seek revenge against her own brother? Yes, that is a part of a folklore which I sort of, uh, sort of the thread uh, that I picked up because that was what made the whole story, sort of made the story, it changed the entire story of what we always have. So uh, I used that as my uh, premise or sort of my argument. And uh, yes, Lanka's princess is that, that is the paradox because if you say he was the king of Lanka, she was his sister, she was the sister of Kumbhakarna and she was the sister of the Vibhishan. So yes, she was Lanka's princess. She was a product of Lanka. We are talking about. She was a part of Lanka. So and she was a princess. And uh, we never ever even see her that way. We just see her as this mad, ugly woman who roaming in the forest. You know. So it's that is the thing. She was Lanka's princess. That was a part of her. Not only her right. That was a part of her personality. Where uh, now whether she accepted Lanka or whether she rejected Lanka, that is her. Uh, that again is her dilemma, personal dilemma. But the thing about Surpanaka was, when I was telling the story of Surpanaka was, I was not trying to glorify her, very honestly. I was not trying to even uh, make her a saint. It was not, there was no question of blanching her or trying to make her black, white or white, black. It was about uh, the story of a woman of her, st- her story, which we really do not know much about besides the two episodes where a, her nose gets chopped off and where she goes to her brother where I think uh, this is one of the most violent episodes in the epic but what happened what, what really if we start going backwards why did it happen because she is the reason why she is the most important person in the second person, second half of the Rama she is the one she who, takes it forward yeah she takes it forward because without her Ram and Ravan wouldn't have met the whole story wouldn't have gone forward so Surpanaka, by making an antagonist, is very limiting. So I just wanted to know her story, being the sister of three powerful men, uh, being the child of two very intelligent people. Yeah. We don't know about her personal life. In fact, many of us don't even know that she was married. She had a son. You know, this entire story about right. history between right. Lakshman and her son. So all these were folk stories. They were threads which I sort of, uh, in the process of research, I found them. And I found an extremely fascinating character where she becomes a victim of her own hate and anger and revenge. So, which is so, again, which is a very common thing where where we prefer to live in anger and hate, then try to redeem ourselves, make a better world for ourselves. You know, it's like we live in our own world of hate and anger and guilt and revenge. So, so Surupadaka becomes a symbol of, literally a symbol of retribution in every way. So all your books, is, you know, they are all stories that are drenched in human emotions. You're trying to cover different facets of society about how these women are. You know, you, you look at their aspect and their point of view. As a writer, I'm sure you have a personal connection with your characters. Out of all your seven books, mm-hmm. which one was the most difficult to write and which drained you completely emotionally? Surpanaka. This uh, one is- yes, because uh, you know, actually thinking of all the negative characters, you know, the negative emotions. Uh, yeah, that anger, that grief, uh, the hate which comes from grief, you know, uh, and how it sort of completely corrodes and poisons you know, that is a part of it. That was difficult. And secondly, I think Saraswati's book, which was again extremely difficult because <clears throat> uh, Saraswati, as I said, after a point, it, it becomes an almost uh, abstract, sublime concept. Now, trying right. to simplify that concept and putting it in layman's words and layman's uh, explanations. That was very difficult because uh, both of them, are obviously, they are intellectuals. And this whole uh, trying to define, analyze intellectualism, intellect, 
the concept of knowledge, the difference between knowledge and wisdom, you know, the difference between information and education, the difference between uh, uh, giving and taking knowledge, this whole, I think so it was, uh, and I think it happened during the pandemic times when things were anyway a little, they were more hard than what they were. So I think it made me more uh, think, uh, as I say, inwards. And I think Saraswati, it was also uh, not only my, I wouldn't say my journey, but at least definitely my, a certain realization about how we are completely, how we ignore that entire concept of information which we have been given to us, you know, how man is using, abusing, misusing information, knowledge. I mean, maybe talk so about, I don't know, we are sorry. talking about science and progress and, no, of course, it's all been there, but then how when you see the progress, is it really sort of, we are still fighting war, there's still death and destruction in disease. We are not learning from, we have not improved in that matter. I mean, scientifically, we might be conquer the moon and the Mars, <clears throat> but when it comes to Earth, we are not being very kind to our fellow beings. So I think this was more, uh, when you're talking about this book was more, and trying to make it relatable, you know, because that's the most important part. Where, the, the, the readers have to relate with what the author is trying to say and try to identify with the characters and try to relate to the character. That's so important because even Brahma, the character trying to, <clears throat> because the Brahma which we see is always this old man with his three faces. So Brahma, yeah. I think again is again a stereotype. We really don't know much about Brahma at all. The importance of, <clears throat> or rather the difficulties of creation. So he creates his own uh, perfect woman and then she sort of, questions him about his own decision so i think this is so i think it was a it, it was it's a it was an extremely engrossing part of i enjoyed uh, writing this book just like i loved writing about lanka's princess because uh, it is also it's sort of a, <clears throat> a mental power even which authors have which i had I personally and i loved it after a point okay and i have to start and sit and write on this so again sort of filtering it sort of sieving it and making it a sort of a rational whole was because otherwise the book would have become a trilogy or something. So I didn't want it to become a trilogy. I just wanted it sort of limited to 300 pages. Right. And I wanted to ask you that question, which we really started talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Is that um, in the book of Sita's sister, mm -hmm. Urmila goes off to sleep because mm -hmm. uh, since uh, Lakshman says, uh, you know, he, he wants to be awake for all those 14 years. He, he passes on that sleep to her, right? Is that how it goes? Yeah. And, and, and then yeah, she passes on the, yeah, she passes on her sleep to her. So she is sleeping for mm -hmm. those 14 years. Mm -hmm. Yet you talk about her being about betrayal and her sacrifice. So I think if sleep is, isn't it something wonderful? How is it a sacrifice? No, because I think I just use that 14 years of sleeping as a metaphor, actually, because that, it was a tatatonic state where she actually, catatonic state where she, the separation, because their story is not of love at all. It's a story of separation. So where she actually becomes numb with that grief and the separation, and she's, she uses that grief, that loneliness, that separation as a way of discovering herself. So in her, so it was not a sleep sleep as such. She is sort of, <clears throat> numb to a certain extent, but her role in the for in the in the palace when uh, her husband had a seat, the sister away. So, what was her role in the palace? I think that was important because one of the threads I read was that she painted through the fourteen years. There was also a story where she sort of painted uh, yes. Ram and Sita's wedding, or even her wedding. You know that entire. So, I think I took a pick up these uh, <clears throat> nuggets and I tried to weave into my own story where. Because when if she goes to sleep, I mean, she, she becomes a completely, what can I write about her besides that she slept? I mean, I can't keep on making it into a subconscious level. I mean, like, so I said, I use that little, the sleep as a part of it. She is in a way sleeping through the pain, through the loneliness, through the separation, through the uh, entered, uh, you know, uh, disappointment of her own personal love right. and her expectation. So the sacrifice is also where so we are talking about it, not her sacrifice also, it is also about, she realizes her role and Lakshman's role in the role, in the lives of Ram and Sita. So if it, Ram is the other side of Sita and Sita is the other side of Ram, I think Lakshman is, it's, 
the parallel is lakshman is the other side of uh, urmila and urmila is the other side of lakshman so both of them without these two the <clears throat> ram and sita would not have been able to right. actually uh, be in what they are so i think the importance i think it, it it's, it's also a very beautiful story of sisterhood over oh, that's why i said it's sita sister which is all concept of four sisters uh, or two sisters and cousins and the relationship how it changes after marriage you know the girls from mithila when they come to ayodhya and how because of a certain political intrigue the, the situation completely changes and how the four sisters react differently so okay. i think uh, it was also a very very uh, it was a story of sisterhood actually yeah. the woman does one woman that helps the other one yeah. they have to so whether they are the four sisters whether the three queens we don't see the women as i say we see three groups of brothers in the ram and we have to we start we have to see the women also you know with the three queens or the three literally is like a sas bahu serial but beyond that you know where where it goes again beyond the stereotypes where there is a crisis in the family and how each one reacts differently so it's said that when the perception of the narrator changes the way a reader perceives a narrator is bound to change as well what do you hope to discover while writing on feminism in indian mythology no no i didn't catch your question I said, when the perception of the narrator changes, so I think you put as a feminist uh, writer, you know, fiction writer, you, when the perception of the narrator for any story that's given to you, you are looking at a different outlook. Mm-hmm. So the reader is also going to perceive the way you are portraying it forward. So yeah. what do you hope to discover when you write about feminism in Indian mythology? For all these yes. kinds. Of- yes, definitely, because I think, uh, as I said, we don't even recognize the women who are there in a. Our- epics honestly besides sita and draupadi but can you imagine a mahabharat without say kunti or a gandhari you know so, you know the importance i think or a satyavati i mean if she would not have been there the story wouldn't have gone forward so i think uh, when i say feminism i think i'm trying to tell a story of a woman because i think women need to tell other women stories it's very very important where and these stories are sort of translated in our daily lives you know even when, when you see around us you do hear a story of surpanaka you see a story of satyavati you see a story of menaka you see the story of ailya so all these people these characters which are supposedly there in the epic are very much there in our lives right and how do we react to this whole thing of they are not isolated characters sort of limited in a book the very fact that we are talking about the epic so many thousands of years later and the characters so many thousands of years later is so i think Uh, the epics or the characters are a certain challenge to the image or uh, they are a part of a certain imaginative process of yeah. the readers also you know what the author is trying to say what i am trying to say through that characters is that these characters are there amongst us we are living those characters and uh, because the problem the issue the situation the circumstances all of them are facing is what we are also facing now so i think the message of the book is there are stories of women the stories of i would not say i don't believe in the strong women if you say a strong woman then there is a weak woman no i think there are stories of complex women you know they all uh, uh, where uh, they are sort of thrown into situation and how they fight back right i think it is not question of winning and losing at all it's a question of they fighting back i think that is what the story of our lives yeah the will to fight back a certain situation so whether it's discrimination whether it's injustice whether it is grief whether it's loss the uh, strength we sort of i think this fighting back is the core strength of a woman so i think uh, the stories of these different women and they might be different women but they are different stories but each of them sort of become a part of a whole right so now i'm just going to open this uh, thing up you there's a question that's come up for you uh, mm-hmm. a question for the audience from richa smukarji and she says that uh, which female character in mythology suffers most by virtue of being told through a patriarchal lens who is the most vilified but shouldn't be in your opinion ailya i think ailya is the most uh, i think she has been completely <coughs> she has been and i think <coughs> but telling her story it was i think i gave her a voice i think the question which she would have wanted to uh, sort of uh, pose on other people of the questions which she wanted answered she didn't want to answer herself she wanted other people to answer her question so i think i i think it definitely 
It's definitely an India. Do we have any other question? And I think uh, they, I can actually say uh, I, Ayla's story is sort of a precursor to Sita's story. So I think right. the other person would be Sita because she has been. <clears throat> she I will just the, the biggest victim of patriarchy. I think. Sorry. I will just unmute uh, Fozia. Sorry, I didn't get it. Hello. So there's a question from Fozia Akram also. I will just unmute her. Right. <clears throat> Hi, Fozia. Fozia, can you unmute yourself? We can hear you, Fozia. Can you speak up? Okay. Uh, Anadita, we can't hear Fozia. I think there's some problem. So, uh, Fozi, can you write your question, please? Uh, we, for some reason, we cannot hear you. So, in the meantime, I'll just ask you one uh, question from my end. You've written books that mainly hold a woman's perspective. You know, of course, Menika's Choice does have a parallel narrative of both Menika and Vishwamitra. But are you planning to write on writing a book that holds only a man's point of view? And if so, on whom are you planning to write? I think I give them a fair chance in the sense. <laughs> My male characters are, it's not that it's completely her people. I think through the seven books, I mean, if you're talking about Saraswati, Brahma has a chance to explain himself. And so it's, uh, I think the male characters are as interesting as the female one. But yes, uh, I am more interested in the woman's uh, story. So, man, yes, as I said once before, I think I'd love to write a story. Uh, like, I'd like to write about Ram because I think okay. he's extremely. Uh, uh, not only a complex, we don't even realize he's a complex character, but I think uh, he's a very misunderstood character, you know, especially in today's time. Uh, I think uh, what Valmiki had in mind and what we made him out to be and how he has been sort of. So I think, yes, Ram, definitely. Right. I would. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Looking forward to that one. Okay. So um, there is... Um, a question from Suchita who says, with a wise character like Gautam, Rishi Gautam, what are your views on how he treated his wife in a societal point of view? Yeah, that's the question. That's the difference between an intelligent man and a wise man. He might have been an intelligent man, but he wasn't definitely a wise man. Yeah. But yes, I think this is a story of, uh, it's a typical, uh, this is one, uh, it's for almost like a stereotype, like, you know, once you get the woman, when you are married to her, I think uh, the perspective of the man also changes in the sense he gets busy in his work, in his relation, in his uh, career. And in the process, he doesn't even realize he's neglecting his wife. You know, he's sort of even overlooking his wife, her needs, her ambitions, her desires. So I think, and when I say desires, I don't mean just sexual desires, I mean desires of a woman, but, you know. So I think this is the story of, this is the problem of most uh, marital relationships where I think once you have something, you don't understand the value of it. It's like this whole thing of taking for granted. Right. Or assuming that she is going to understand. When he is not in a he's not he's not ready to give, ready to budge an inch or even trying to understand her change situation. So I think uh, uh, here Gautam becomes a victim of his own scholarliness, of his ambition, where he wants to be, he wants to like he really wants he wants to be a marriage. He does eventually become, but at the cost of what? He is his wife in there. So I think, uh, no, definitely not a wise man. No, definitely not a smart man. He is an intelligent man, yes, but then not a wise man. Again, the difference between right. intelligent and wisdom. <laughs> any other question? Uh, do we have any other question? Okay, I just want to ask you one uh, last little question from my side. Mythology uh, fiction is inspired by themes and symbolism of myth, legend, folklore, and fairy tales. When fiction is added to mythology to mm -hmm. cover character or to, or to flesh out the skeletal information that's available for an author, what risk do we run with all these alternative perspectives? Is the real story lost? Will it be, will it be lost in time? No, not at all, because I think... Uh... When we say the epics have so many versions, you know? so I think that that is the part creative license each writer, each artist has taken and used that story. So if you actually go to the original story and then you see the 
the story of Ahilya or the uh, story of Lexi Shakuntala, the Kalidasi Shakuntala is a different from Mahabharata Shakuntala. Uh, it shows a certain creative ethos, which I think the epics, the society permitted the artist to have, the writer to have. So I think this we should enjoy this creative uh, freedom, which the authors enjoyed. They sort of translated it through their works. And I think the reader enjoyed it through the century. So I think each version, everyone knows that they are versions. You know, it's not what the original is. The original story is there and how it has changed for whatever reason, whether it is uh, a creative license of the author, social, certain social political situation, whatever. But I think <coughs> that the fact that it survived so many thousands of years, it's going to survive another thousands of years because of this, because the immediacy the readers feel to this story, the certain right. relatability. I think that is what makes this story so palpable. We are so living, a part of us. And I think that's also the reason why mythology fiction, you know, as a subject is, is really um, gaining a lot of popularity and, uh, you know, the yes, sub- because I think we don't, we don't really see uh, uh, yeah. in literature and mythology uh, actually yeah. have always been, they coexisted together, where, uh, right. where actually the stories of, uh, the stories and uh, folklore have been used as a literary tool by the authors to convey a certain message of right. the current social political situation current uh, personal crisis you know whatever of right. uh, uh, man and society man and man as an individual man as a uh, family member a family man so i think uh, each time uh, these stories have been used as literary techniques so i think uh, first and foremost i think we have to realize that uh, especially in our regional literature this school is rich of data these stories of the, from the epics and the Purans are part of regional literature. So they have always, not only, they're not fables, they're not moral lessons, because I think what is very more important about this is the strong philosophical content, more right. than the moral content, you know, where the psychological impact, you know, when you see each of these characters, why do you think we identify so much with the Mahabharata? Because Mahabharata is a story of is the most biggest anti-war statement actually <coughs> and it is also a story of where each one of them contributed to the war and became a victim of that war right. so that is why we identify because the fight between two cousins fight between the, the con- complete conflict between cousins and uh, human relationship is so beautifully portrayed in the Mahabharata that uh, yes we see it huh? oh, you see a petal part of you there you see a little part of the cousin there you see a part of the aunt you know, it's, these stories are just not, uh, as I said, they're not just stories and folklore and legends. They have been colored by each individual interpretation through the century. So you imagine how rich a legacy they have. They are, and I think they are going to be. Right. So I think with that, um, we're really reaching the end point. Uh, are there any other questions that I can take up or are we done here? So, thank you so much, Tavita um, Ji. Um, it was, I don't know, you are, the throat's been troubling you. But thank you so much for this animated session. I've really enjoyed uh, seeing your point of view and uh, enjoying, uh, you know, our conversation here. Uh, Uma, over to you, please. Thanks, Dipali. On behalf of the Foundation, I would like to thank Mrs. Kavita and Ms. Dipali Vaseen. I would also like to show gratitude towards our associate for today's session, Indian Norwegian community. Last but not the least, I would like to thank our patrons who have made these sessions possible even during these difficult times. Stay well, stay safe, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for this entire conversation, this interaction. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And yes, uh, I think the only thing I would like to say is that if anyone wants to uh, ask further questions, uh, they couldn't ask now because of the time limitation. And of course, also- and that's a latest book. So uh, it's really Sarasati's gift, right? Yeah. Yes. So do send me a feedback. Uh, after that is okay. You can send me a feedback if you read it. So do send me a feedback, whatever positive, negative. It's like, I think the author also, that is also a part of an author's life where you write something, there's a communication, you know, between the writer and your uh, reader. So yes, 
the reader's response is most valued and the most important part of the author's uh, definition, I think, the very existence. So I think, thank you very much to all of you, to the audience, to, all, uh, to the Prabhakaitan Foundation, to all of you all. Have a, it's a happy, happy Diwali, happy day. Diwali, happy yes. Diwali. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank you, Prabhakaitan Foundation. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you so much.